Well, somebody was saying to me uh, the other night, I was talking about 3D graphics and being in, doing an animation and well, back when I was college and pushing Blender and they says, well, what relationship do you have to the uh, animation industry? You work professionally in the, have you worked for Dream, uh, DreamWorks? Can you, have you, oh, I was, no, I went to SIGGRAPH four times. I was a volunteer several times. I thought I was going to make it into the industry. You know, because they were telling us way back in 95 that uh, that any studio would take any, or in 94, that anybody uh, in the Hollywood would take in anybody that had any ounce of uh, 3D graphics experience. And they would look at my degree, and I mean, they would look at me, they would see that I was, my, I didn't have my degree yet, and I was a computer programmer. And not a not a traditional animator, not a not a. I didn't have any art background, and I was doing an animation, and you know, you know, and I was just like, I was disturbed that they weren't hiring me up, and I was like, you know, I could have been a technical director, I could have been anything, you know, and. Uh, when I finally did get out of college, the the industry was flooded with people, and um, the Mark Hinn told me, or I mean, I remember how long it took Mark Hinn to get into Pixar. He had it took him eight years. He had to work at the rhythm and he's for for um, for um, eight years or something like that, four years. He was he had a bachelor's degree from UNM. He went to California and he was at Rhythm and Hughes for eight years and then he got to get work at Pixar. So and how long was he at Pixar? Well, up until I think it was I think he said six years ago or I got to talking to him. I got into LinkedIn. I was trying to get LinkedIn to him and and I had a little talk with him and he said he left Pixar. He's now at Washington University. And it sounded to me like he was sad, like something had happened to Pixar. Um, you know, I don't know what happened at Pixar. Um, and, uh, but after I got out of college, some of my friends that had worked for Sony, I had a friend who named, Thomas Keller that worked for Sony to make video games. There was another guy um, by the name of oh darn it, what is his name? Um, it'll come to me. But it's another guy that worked at uh, worked at Sony working on PlayStation games and. Uh, And I got a friend who still works at, uh, who works for Electronic Arts. Um, his name is Dante Dufresne. And I still have him in my Facebook. I think he's still working for Electronic Arts. I think he was working on Madden football games and stuff. Um, and he, he, he spent quite a while, even after he got his degree, um, working on 3D graphics and dem doing demos, demonstrations, trying to get a job in the 3D industry. I was, I was kind of just uh, miffed by everything, and I didn't. Uh, I just, well, I was miffed by Wavefront, and I was eager to try to push Blender, and I guess I just let, got consumed by Blender by pushing it that I just lost interest in uh, doing anything with uh, trying to get a job as an animator. I could just see that myself going in to getting a job in uh, 3D animation and not being able to apply um, much talent towards traditional animation because I don't have that experience. My experience with the, my, what I did with Rise of the Thorax was all intuitive. 
that was me. That was no traditional background went into that. That was just me screwing around with software, trying to make things look realistic. You can make, you can do good 3D animation if you can, if you know what doesn't look good in the shots and just rework the stuff until it looks good. You could, anybody can do animation just as long as you're persnickety enough about detail, about how things need to be look realistic. You know, you just have to be a, a much more anal artist to do that kind of stuff. And I didn't want to put the work into it. I wanted to find some way into, into the computer field. And, I, and, and to make a long story short, I kind of just uh, didn't bother to get a job. And I, would, I didn't even have a job whenever I was in college. My dad was paying my way. And so I'd say that I was probably the biggest victim of circumstance in, ex in ever, and I still am to an extent. Um, all this knowledge is going to waste. Doesn't bother me. But I can just foresee things in the future happening uh, with VR and uh, 2D content. Well, some people are saying that uh, with VR, that um, the headsets give you headaches. Well, that's true, and that's probably because the refresh rate isn't fast enough. If it were faster, uh, it it wouldn't give you the headaches that you probably can. The other thing is is that you don't get to whip your, your head around as much um, with the VR headset on. Um, that's probably the reason why Microsoft's working on glasses with uh, with VR augmentation, but um, I don't know how to remedy those people who get headaches with VR. I'm just saying that VR, um, the, just the ability to see a circus performance where there's stuff 30 feet above you and 100 feet in every direction and the reality is that you're sitting in a room that's no bigger than uh, a thousand square feet, you know, or even less than that, something that's, that's, uh, 600 square feet. Uh, you're in a room that's 400 square feet, uh, it's 200 square feet. You're in a bathroom and you're using a VR and you're seeing stuff that's far off in the distance. You know, after having that kind of experience, why the friggin', why would any Study have anything to do with old media, old 2D media, movies. What would any, what 2D video games, who would want to have anything to do with that? You know? Uh, so it's just a matter of everybody getting a taste of what is possible. And that's the reason why I got three goes. Um, I plan to show everybody I know what VR can do so that they're not looking on the outside, looking at these uh, these fools with these headsets on and uh, saying, yeah, look, that guy, is, he looks funny. What is, what is he doing the VR? That stuff is complete crap until you try it. And when you try it, you're like, wow, that's amazing. How is that even possible? That's going to be their reaction. And I aim to capture that with this VR camera. If I am able to get those guys that I work with at work to even use the VR headset. And I'll tell you what I am. I'm, I'm a bagger for Kroger. Um, I make a little money, and I will not say how. That uh, pays me uh, money for life. I've got that, and then I've got, uh, I'm, I'm a bagger. Now, if it, all that goes away, I've got this Channel Z that I'm doing that I did some PHP programming. I've got the ability to teach people Blender. 
I got the ability to uh, to talk about uh, writing computer languages. I could I could be a support person for Linux. Uh, I could talk about uh, su sudo, which means super user do. People say sudo. Um, it's sudo, super user do. The, your super user. That's what su stands for in in Linux. Um, super user. They always called them the super user root. Um, what's the numbers in chmod? They're octal for the individual permissions that you have for the flags. Um, so seven five five is um, is write is read and write uh, for um, that's for personal or no um, yeah. Seven. If the first one is for personal, the second one is for group, and the second and the third one is for um, is for world um, permissions um, to do the files. It's a very simple way of doing. Um, it's a very simple way of doing uh, permissions. And what you do with group is you assign the groups to the file that the group number that has for which that uh, group permission represents. And in the group, you specify the user IDs that are part of the group. And world is uh, everybody else that's outside of the group. And then the you, then your, self, your own permissions. And then uh, that's all part of the CH mod. I could talk about, you know, I could talk about any kind of technology I want to. I could be a teacher and make money that way. But I, for now, I'm essentially a little bit like Richard Stallman. Richard Stallman's got some money on the back end that he he doesn't have to. He All he can be is uh, somebody who goes out there and talks and, and communicates to people about open source. I could do the very same thing. I could probably get uh, a special deal with with uh, Richard and we could get together and put our minds together and go out and basically uh, um, basically let everybody know what open source is you know I'm just kidding um, I see myself as a tech evangelist that's what I'm going to be for the rest of my life until I die as a tech evangelist who is a bagger for Kroger um, the only reason I'm a bagger for Kroger is because I'm left with my parents. And uh, there's the, also those guys out there that say, oh, I moved away from my parents long ago. I have children now, and, I, you know, look at me. I'm, I, I've got a life, and I go to beer festivals in Europe, and I'm just like, good for you, mate, you know. I live with my parents. And the only reason why I'm a bagger for Kroger is because uh, my brother got upset with me. So you're, you know, you're a, you're a, um, uh, you're a um, victim of circumstance. I didn't know what that one meant. What's a victim of circumstance? Somebody who lives off somebody else. And I was. I was living off of my father. And I was living with him and uh, looking after him. And I didn't realize that um, if you didn't get into a job after being out of college, then nobody would hire you even if you had the experience. You know, you know even if you were training yourself, even if you're programming. I was actively programming PHP. Um, and I got involved with a guy named David Kilman who worked for Telemed at Los Alamos National Labs, and uh, we were going to push PIDS technology, which I claim is the reason why our healthcare, inf our healthcare informatics, uh, that PIDS didn't take off, is the reason why uh, the healthcare informatics inf 